All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this media briefing about COVID-19 in Idaho today. Uh, my name is Nikki Forbingor, and I will be the moderator. Uh, please note that everyone should be muted unless they are speaking. ASL interpretation is available today. If you search for the ASL interpreter and hover over the three little dots in the window, you can lock it in place on your screen. We are very pleased to have uh, Governor Little start us off today with some opening remarks, and then he will leave the media briefing. Health and Welfare Director Dave Jepson will then provide some remarks along with Dr. Catherine Turner and Dr. Christopher Ball, and then we'll open it up for media questions. With that, I will turn it over to Governor Little. Thank you, Nikki, uh, and thanks all of you for joining us today. In just a few weeks, Idaho students will be returning to their classrooms for the new school year. And once again, it has become so important for us to protect their ability to learn safely in their classrooms with few interruptions. With more and more Idahoans getting vaccinated since the start of the year, we have seen a steady decline in cases throughout spring and summer. But now COVID variants are spreading and we're seeing more COVID cases and hospitalizations across the country and here in Idaho. Thankfully, more than 750,000 Idahoans have chosen to receive the vaccine. All along, our goal has been to protect lives and critical health care capacity. That is still our goal. And the vaccine has been hugely important to us. But with the new school year upon us, we should renew our commitment to our students. Simply put, we need more Idahoans to choose to receive the vaccine if our kids have a chance at a normal school year, one that is entirely in person without outbreaks and quarantines. The COVID vaccine is safe and effective. It's been tested, and yes, some see side effects, but they're generally very minimal. The vaccine almost guarantees that if you get COVID, you won't get as sick from the disease if you've been vaccinated. But don't take my word for it. If you're among the folks who are still waiting to see about the vaccine, please consider talking to a doctor about it. Not only for your sake, but to assure our kids are safe and back in school. I appreciate the members of the news media on the call today for your help in getting out good information about the vaccine to help combat a lot of bad misinformation out there about it. And as always, thank you to Dave and his crew at Health and Welfare for hosting these calls so we can continue to communicate with Idahoans about the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Okay, uh, with that, we will turn it over to DHW Director uh, Dave Jepson. Uh, well, thank you, Nikki, and thanks to the governor who uh, joined us today. Um, well, I have really two main points I want to make today. The first is that the Delta variant is here and the dominant uh, version of the virus in Idaho. And that's really the underlying driver of why our coronavirus metrics have really gone the wrong way for the last several weeks. Uh, and in fact, the last time we've seen numbers like where we are right now was back in January to March earlier this year. Uh, we continue to see the number of cases rise. Um, the statewide seven-day moving average of cases per 100,000 was down as low as 3.3 uh, per 100,000 on July 5th, and as of uh, yesterday, yesterday was 18.4 per 100,000. Uh, for many weeks, we had uh, almost all of our counties with less than 10 cases per 100,000, and as of now, we have over half of our counties above 10 cases per 100,000. Uh, COVID-19 testing a positivity, which is a good indicator of virus activity, uh, is increasing from a low of about 2.8% a few weeks ago up to 8.0% uh, today or as of this week. Uh, and we continue to see the number of cases at long-term care centers uh, rise. We had seen that declining for many, many months. Uh, we're now seeing that start to rise. Uh, and then perhaps most concerningly, we see an increase in the number of COVID-19 patients in the hospital and in the ICU. In fact, we've seen those numbers more than double since July 1st. Uh, and as we look forward, we see uh, uh, the fall with the return of the flu season and people returning to more indoor activities, uh, which leaves us concerned. 
Uh, so that was message one, is the Delta variant, variant is here and it's uh, moving our numbers the wrong way. Uh, message number two for me today is that there is good news. Uh, we do have um, the vaccine and widely available in the state, and we're starting to see the vaccination rates increase. Uh, over the past two weeks in particular, we've seen the number of first doses start to rise. Uh, that's good news. And in fact, we just passed 50% of those 12 and older getting a first dose. Uh, for those of you that have chosen to get the vaccine, I say thank you. For those of you who have not been vaccinated, I urge you to consider getting the vaccine. Uh, it is the way that we will bring this pandemic to an end. Uh, as evidenced by the over 160 million Americans and over 750,000 Idahoans who have taken the vaccine in the past year, we know the vaccines are safe and very effective. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ball. Thank you very much, uh, Director. And um, I'm very pleased to be here today. And I'd really like to start off by thanking all of the clinical laboratories in Idaho that have uh, taken an opportunity to send samples into the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories for sequencing. This has been incredibly valuable for us. Uh, just in the month of July, we've received over a thousand samples from 25 submitters around the state. And this is really helping us get a much better picture of the variants of SARS coronavirus 2 that are circulating in Idaho. And unfortunately, as the director alluded to, we've seen a very big switch in a very short period of time. To give you a little bit more information, if we look at sequencing that was performed on positive samples that were collected between the middle of May and the middle of June, the most abundant variant that we saw was the alpha variant at about 76%. If we just fast forward another 30 days and start looking at sequencing that was performed on samples that were collected from the middle of June to the middle of July, not only did we see an increase in the number of samples sequenced, but we saw 81.3% of those sequences being returned as the Delta variant. This rapid shift in variant composition is very consistent with what we've seen in other states. And we can certainly say that the Delta variant is widely circulating in Idaho right now. With a little bit more information about why this is happening and what it may mean for Idahoans, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Turner so that she can provide a little bit of additional detail. Dr. Turner? Thanks, Dr. Ball, and um, thank you for participating in the media briefing and good afternoon. So as Dr. Ball just described, the Delta variant of the virus is here in Idaho, and the precipitous increase in our daily case counts that Director Jepson summarized is certainly additional evidence that the Delta variant is circulating in our communities. Uh, this variant is much more transmissible than previous variants of the virus, such as the alpha variant that we detected circulating in Idaho earlier this year. And with previous virus lineages, what we observed is that a person who was infected with um, the virus went on to infect on average somewhere between two and three people. However, uh, recent studies of outbreaks associated with people who have been infected with the Delta variant have indicated that when that person is infected, they will in turn infect somewhere between five and nine people. Um, one way to think of this is that the Delta variant is at least twice as contagious as the variants that we that have circulated recently in Idaho. So that's very concerning. Um, the numbers can be somewhat abstract. There isn't a lot of difference between a person infecting three people versus five people, right? Um, it's just the difference of two people. However, increased trans transmissibility poses an exponential um, threat. Even if the transmissibility went from, say, three people on average to just four people on average, over 10 generations of transmission, you would have half a million additional infections, which is a quarter of Idaho's population. So even though that um, average number of people infected is, that difference is small when you start multiplying that, it can have significant impacts. The other concerning aspect of the Delta variant is related to what we refer to as the viral load of people who are infected. And scientists have looked at how much virus people have in their nose and throat when they're infected. And it appears that those who are infected with the Delta variant tend to have more virus and that it is detectable much earlier after exposure compared to infections with um, viral lineages that came before. It's possible that the incubation period, 
which is that time between when a virus enters your body, starts to replicate, and then you're able to spread it to others, it's possible this incubation period is shorter with the Delta variant. So there's a complication period, a higher viral load, and then the biological aspects of the variant that help it invade human cells. All of these factors together explain why this variant is so concerning and why recommendations have changed recently as new science has emerged about this variant. This includes the recommendation to wear masks indoors if you're in an area with substantial or high transmission. However, as Director Jefferson mentioned, there's good news, and that is that the currently authorized vaccines in the US do provide protection against this variant and vaccination is one of the best ways to reduce the chance of additional viral mutations in the future. It's possible this variant may result in increased vaccine breakthrough infections, but recent investigations of outbreaks that do include vaccinated people tell us that those who are, are vaccinated are significantly less likely to have severe illness that requires hospitalization or leads to death. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Nikki Forbing or to help facilitate the question and answer period. All right. Thank you, Dr. Turner.